with the um, the um, formable low uh, carbon steels. And um, so we had seen that um, w whereas we, c we couldn't make um, formable steels, very formable steels, usually the price we had to pay for the formability was the, the really low strength. And um, obviously uh, for technical uh, reasons, uh, in, t in the applications, there is a need for a larger palette or variation of, of strength levels in the products. So uh, this has um, led to the development of uh, the uh, so the uh, refos steels that we discussed. Uh, the high strength IF steels, which are basically uh, usually also phosphorus added, uh, manganese added, silicon added uh, IF steels, which are solid solution hardened, yes. So we can solid solution harden our steel uh, and um, keep the formability. However, as I explained to you with solid solution hardening, uh, you have very strong strain hardening, uh, excuse me, uh, solid solution hardening from phosphorus. Uh, and then second comes manganese and silicon. And um, so uh, two of these elements, in particular phosphorus and silicon, are uh, detrimental if you add too much of it, of them. Uh, and uh, typically uh, 750 PPM is about the most uh, people will add um, if, uh, if you want to have a formable uh, rephosphorized uh, grade. And uh, with silicon also, um, half a percent of that order, maybe slightly higher, but, but not as much as you would like to add to get you know, very large strengthening effect. Um, now, obviously, uh, we know that a manganese is, uh, there's nothing wrong with the manganese, right? We talked about the manganese. It's a, um, it's, it doesn't have detrimental effects of phosphorus and silicon in terms of the embrittling uh, uh, effects. Uh, so what's wrong with adding lots of manganese, right? Uh, well, you know, that's, that's a choice. Um, uh, in general, however, when we add amount, larger amounts of alloying elements, it, it, it means that we have to alloy, uh, add ferro alloys. Yeah? So the price of the product goes up. Hmm? That's uh, one point, a very uh, practical point. The other thing is, of course, uh, when you start adding manganese, uh, around 4% of it, yes, uh, the material starts to uh, uh, have other properties. It will air harder. It will, you know, it will very easily turn into martensite. Okay, so you, you get into another other, uh, situation, basically, of uh, behavior. Hmm? So, um, so uh, and, and what we see in general, uh, you know, when, when we're using manganese just to strengthen, um, you know, typical amounts that we add are Two, two and a half percent, that's about the maximum, right? So, uh, so here, okay. So, um, and if you go through the calculation, you can see that um, you're never going to be able to achieve uh, very high strengths with, with just adding phosphorus, a little bit of phosphorus, a little bit of manganese, a little bit of silicon. And, and you have to look for other solutions. And, and that's basically... Um, what we're going to talk about today. We'll say very few words about HSLA steels because we already talked about them. I'll, I'll just go through the concept once more so you, uh, you, know, you remember it. Um, uh, we, of course, we did talk about bake hardening. And there are other 
uh, uh, ways of uh, increasing the strength and keeping formability uh, and that's using what we would call structurally hardened materials. That's where you, instead of having a homogeneous ferritic microstructure, yes, you, you start going into a multi-phase microstructure, multi-phase microstructure. And the, the, the big advantage of doing this is the main element that allows you to do this is carbon. Yes, and carbon is very uh, 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 cost-effective alloying element because we've got plenty of it in, uh, in, in many steels uh, at the very beginning of their, of their uh, production. So, um, so we have uh, DP steels, we call them dual-phase steels, the trip steels, and we'll also see <coughs> uh, uh, take into discussion the benetic steels and the so-called ferritic Benetic steels, okay? Right, so um, one of the, uh, the things that happens, of course, is when you uh, uh, go into uh, structural hardening hmm, uh, using carbon as the main uh, alloying element, um, there are secondary factors that will come into play. Hmm? And one of the important secondary factor is welder, welding and weldability. Uh, this is not a course about welding, but it's important to mention this because it kind of puts a cap, a maximum, on how much carbon you are willing to put into the material. Hmm? Okay, so um, one of the things that uh, people who do welding focus on is the so-called carbon equivalent, carbon equivalent value. And um, it's basically an empirical quantity. Mm, it's like um, the formula is in the textbook. It's like carbon plus manganese plus silicon divided by six, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an empirical value that gives you an idea of how easily you can turn that, the steel with that particular composition into martensite, yeah? So if you, uh, if you add, for instance, a lot of carbon, it's easy to turn it into martens the steel into martensite. If you add a lot of manganese, and I just told you four to five percent is enough, your steel will turn automatically into martensite. You don't have to quench anything. Uh, so uh, carbon equivalent. The other thing that many people forget to mention is that it's not only important to focus on how easy it is to make martensite, because the carbon equivalent, but the properties of the martensite itself. And that's just carbon content uh, related. Hmm? So, so when you look at the weldability of a steel, yes, you want to make sure that you don't make too much martensite when you weld, why is welding and martensite so related? Because when you weld, you heat up the material very quickly and you cool it down quickly also, right? And so there's a big chance, and you know, many welds are martensitic, yes? So they'll be hard, and they may be hard and brittle if they contain lots of carbon, right? And if they're hard and brittle, and uh, you know, they're, they're cooled from the, uh, the solid, uh, from the liquid phase very quickly to the uh, lower temperatures, uh, you may end up having cracks, yes, and what we call in general welding problems. Yeah? And they're very often related to the ease of having low carbon, a uh, high carbon, excuse me, high carbon martensite. So if I have a high carbon equivalent value and a high carbon content, yes, then my material is difficult to weld. Yes? And the reason is because you make brittle martensite. Yes? If your carbon content is low, the mart you may make martensite, but it's not brittle. It's not even hard, right? So that's why if I was telling you that you know, if you add lots of manganese to steel, it turns into martensite easily, 
But whether or not that martensite is brittle depends on the carbon content. So let's say we have a high carbon equivalent, yes, for instance in this range, I see that as I reduce the carbon content, I go into the zone where it's readily weldable. And what is happening? Well, it's just because I have a low carbon content. Yes? And that, here it's presented as a, as a clear line here. The, the range where, a, 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 you know, a martensite turns into uh, easily difficult to weld is around 0.15. 0.15% of carbon, yes? And that's also wh when, we'll, when we'll discuss the dual phase steels, the HSLA steels, the uh, trip steels, the ferrite bainite steels. We'll see that the amount of carbon that we add to these steels is, is always less than 0.2% of carbon because of this welding thing, yeah? We don't want to make hard and brittle martensite when we weld these things. So normal, you know, car many of the carbon steels, they're, they're in this region here. We'll see that uh, with our HSLA steels that we're using, we are able to achieve strength, yes, by grain, grain refinement, right? And that allows us to um, go below this 0.1% uh, of carbon, yes? And so the material is, is very easily weldable. You never re really have to worry about weldability of HSLA steel. One of the reasons why they're so popular in, in, uh, in technology is related to this, yes? If you want to make um, huge boats, yes, uh, you're going to have automatic welding, you know, automatic welding. And, uh, you know, if you have a steel, that doesn't give you any welding problems. Yes, that's one of one big problem less to worry about when you do this welding. Okay, so HSLA steel um, in that side. So uh, let, uh, just skip this slide here. It's a little bit too. Uh, yeah. But you remember how we? So let's first start with these HSLA steels. They're very widely used. They're uh, relatively formable, and um, and and. Uh, we're talking about the niobium HSLA steels where, uh, where you get, instead of having recrystallization of the strip, if, if we make a hot rolled product, it doesn't have to be a hot rolled product, but let's say we make a hot rolled uh, product here. Instead of having a very fast recrystallization between the two uh, deformation passes, you now have a recrystallization that's much slower and that allows us to accumulate uh, 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 strain in my grains. And, and this is shown here. Again, if the this is the recrystallization kinetics, there's no niobium. And if you have about 400 ppm of niobium, you get this bay in the recrystallization kinetics related to strain-induced niobium carbide precipitation. Yes? And you, you use this slowing down of the uh, uh, precipitation to achieve this grain refinement. Um, it's and so what, you, what we get is that um, we get the, the effect is very subtle. You have effects that are due to the niobium and to the carbides that are present. Hmm? Yes, and to the rearrangement of the carbon when you do the transformation. Hmm? So, um, so what you have if in the austenite, when you roll the austenite, there is the effect of niobium at the grain bound, at the, not at the grain boundaries, at, excuse me, at the grain boundaries between recrystallized austenite and deformed austenite. So that has an effect that retards the uh, recrystallization. The niobium carbide may precipitate due to the deformation in, re in uh, the deformed austenite, and these particles will also have an effect, retard the motion of the recrystallization uh, front. And there is also an effect on the transformation. Hmm? So again, these solute niobium atoms can B at the interface yeah, between alpha and gamma when you do the transformation and 
there is also a, an effect of the niobium carbide particles on the, uh, the transformation front here. Hmm? Okay. Niobium is the most efficient uh, micro alloying element. Yeah? And, and that's the reason is because the other two micro alloying elements, titanium and vanadium, do not interact as effectively with the, uh, the, the hot deformation process. Hmm? Hmm? So, what we uh, you can study this by looking at the, the softening behavior and see that uh, the softening behavior is very fast if there is no niobium. And as you add niobium, the kinetics of the softening of the recrystallization are, is slower. And the effect is very strong with niobium. Hmm? And we can see this by looking at the non-recrystallization temperature, as I told you. Titanium is much less effective. And vanadium is really not effective at all. Tight, um, um, the vanadium and uh, particular vanadium nitride precipitation happens after the transformation mainly and the um, and the titanium is just less effective um, uh, as a an element giving solute drag and also the titanium carbides are formed at lower temperatures hmm? so there's no with niobium, you have a perfect match between the rolling, finishing rolling, and the, uh, the precipitation uh, a sequence of the niobium carbide, okay? And, and so in, in HSLA steel, we have what we call controlled rolling, which gives us a, a large uh, or larger uh, temperature between the AR3 temperature, that's the temperature with transformation start, and the non-recrystallization temperature. Hmm? Okay. I, I remind you of the fact that also directly after the transformation, because of the big difference, very large difference in solubility of the niobium carbide, there is a burst of precipitation of niobium carbide at the interface. So when the interface, the, the uh, ferrite, uh, uh, the austenite rather transforms into ferrite at the interface you suddenly have on one side you have a phase with very low solubility for um, uh, carbon and uh, uh, for, for carbon but also for niobium carbon and here you have a phase which had very high solubility for your uh, niobium carbide so when you get the interface formed, you get also a lot of precipitation in, uh, in the matrix, in the ferrite matrix. Hmm? Right, so um, again, th this is a diagram we, we've seen before, but you, you can see that by, uh, in, in these steels, uh, if you do a normal cooling, you get ferrite plus perlite uh, microstructure, yes, and uh, that is basically the one we are, we are doing here. We are doing a, an accelerated uh, cooling of deformed um, uh, austenite to, to form a very fine ferrite plus perlite mixture, phase mixture. Okay, so typical compositions. Um, I want to, to, uh, to focus on, on this for a moment. Is, and this is very important, is the very low carbon content, yes? The, 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 this carbon content is smaller than 1, 0.1 carbon, yes? And so this, this makes this steel ideally um, um, weldable. Mm -hmm. the, the, the top one, the top steel is a, uh, is, is, is a simple carbon manganese steel. Bottom one is a microalloy steel, and you can tell it's microalloy because of the about 400 ppm niobium that's added. Hmm? Okay. Um, these steels are also like other st other steels. When you make flat rolled material, uh, you know there, there'll be some variation in the properties as a function of the. Uh, 
the direction in which you test. But if you look at the values, the variations in the values, they're not very large. Hmm? You can see here uh, values change. So uh, these steels are relatively isotropic, yes? And, and certainly uh, the hot rolled uh, uh, constructional steels are not very, um, are, are not very textured. Hmm? Um, right, and, and this is the same here for, uh, this was for a standard constructional steel. Oops, and this is uh, the same, but here for the HSLA steel. And again, you can see not many variations in, uh, in properties for um, HSLA steels. So important <coughs> is that when it comes to the microstructure, hmm, these are microstructures here. This is a standard uh, constructional steel, yes? And this is the HSLA, it's an HSLA steel. So if you look at it, they basically look very much the same, yes? So you have uh, ferrite grains and a little bit of uh, perlite in between, yes? Of course, the, the big difference is the grain size, yes? And then the other thing that's different is, and you can't see this at this level of resolution, is the presence of precipitates in the uh, microalloyed grain. Hmm? The other thing um, is that, uh, in general, I have to say, the, um, the, the level of alloying is lower. So you have lower silicon and manganese. You have lower amount of perlite for the same strength. These uh, two, two grades have slightly different strengths, so you can't really compare them uh, as such. Uh, but the contribution to the strength from the grain size is very much larger in the case of the HSLA steel. Hmm? So this is much larger contribution of uh, uh, the grain size to grain size strengthening to the, the overall strength. And, and the, what the niobium allows you to do is, in fact, to take this kind of steel, yes, and go to lower grain sizes, yes? So what we see are two things in this graph here. We get a considerable reduction in grain size. You see here this pack of grains, uh, of um, uh, grades here, have a grain size about five micron, typically. And uh, there is also a, a shift upwards from the, between the conventional carbon manganese constructional steels to the HSLA steel, and that is due to precipitation strain, okay? Okay, so you, uh, if, if you're wondering which one gives you the, the biggest contribution, it's the grain size reduction. Hmm? If you, if, you, um, if you look at this diagram here, this is the contribution from uh, the titanium of vanadium uh, to the strength in terms of um, maybe solid s solution strengthening or, uh, and the precipitation hardening. Hmm? All right. Right, and, and so uh, again, um, in the, your notes, uh, lecture notes, there are plenty of tables uh, giving you some uh, European and North American uh, standards for HSLA steels. Um, one of the things, uh, of course, you don't have to uh, learn any of this uh, by heart, but what is important for you to notice is uh, we can increase the strength, yes? of the steels. Remember that in the European standards for structural steels, S, yes, uh, these values here, uh, 420, 460, refer to strength levels. Uh, so what do we see? We see that uh, we achieve strength by increasing the carbon content, but the carbon content is relatively low. We don't go beyond this 0.1% of carbon to avoid uh, welding problems. And of course, there is always addition of niobium in these steels. Hmm? Strength levels, uh, 
as I said, in the European uh, standards, this number here refers to the, the yield strength. So you, you can see uh, what the uh, minimum yield strength, what typical yield strength levels are. Hmm? Uh, in this case uh, of HSLA, we don't see any reference to R values or N values. They're typically rather low. Hmm? Uh, in comparison to the IF steels, but you, you're, you still have uh, uh, quite good formability. Hmm? Uh, so you have, these are uh, hot, uh, these are ASTM uh, grades, and uh, the strength levels for these steels. Uh, these are cold rolled uh, HSLA steels. Again, note the carbon content. Um, if of course, also in these steels, as you want to increase the, uh, the strength levels, you, you, know, you will pull out different tricks in addition to the grain size reduction. And, and you do see here that uh, as you increase the strength, the manganese content is also increased um, to increase the strength by solid solution hardening. Hmm? And again, uh, typical mechanical properties uh, that we have here. Same type of tables uh, you have for ASTM, okay? Good, but let's look at the big picture of things. And um, what we see with the niobium HSLA steels, yes? Uh, these are these uh, uh, these symbols here, uh, dark gray symbol squares, yes, and um, uh, we see that they are here and here and here and here and here and here and here. So um, we do have we we have achieved higher strengths than the IF steels, but. Uh, with these niobium steels, but we did this at a price, a price of reduced um, elongations, yes? So reduced formability. And so um, uh, there are uh, uh, alternative grades, which as I said, are structurally uh, uh, strengthened by uh, using a multi-phase microstructure um, which avoid this problem to a certain extent. And, and so you can see here that, um, let me see, the, uh, the uh, DP steels, yes, um, and here the trip steels, yes, uh, achieve higher strengths, yes, without a loss in ductility, with a comparable ductility as DP steels. Hmm? And, um, and, and these are important parts, for instance, to make uh, structural parts in, in car bodies. Yes? Uh, structural parts are, for instance, this part here, which is called the B pillar or A pillars uh, in the car. Here, these, these parts here that cross the, uh, the body are called cross members, a couple of those in the car. So these are important parts in all the cars. You want them to be very strong, but at the same time, you also want them to be formable because they'll be, they'll be press formed, and, uh, and you want them to be weldable also. Hmm? So uh, that's one of the reasons that, uh, uh, that has pushed Oops, the development of these uh, DP steels and trip steels and ferrite bainite, ferrite bainite steels. Higher strengths and uh, formability. So let's look at uh, this dual phase steel. Yes, and uh, so dual phase refers to the fact that I have two phases. Yes, and these two phases are, uh, if I look at this uh, color micrograph, the, this brown uh, grains are ferrite, yes, and uh, these uh, 
uh, very bright grains here, yellow grains are martensite, yes, and uh, there can be a little bit of retained austenite. So in principle, when you see a micrograph, yes, unless somebody's told you that it's, um, you know, what it is, or unless you have analyzed this, these particles yourself, yes, it's just a micrograph, right? These little yellow particles are yellow particles, right? So they could be austenite or they could be martensite. Hmm? So in general, you know, uh, uh, I can't tell that this is martensite. Just as much, you can't tell it either. You, know, you, you need more information. Hmm? Uh, uh, and, and you need to have resolution to do this test, right? So one of the ways you can analyze whether these particles are martensite or, or, or something else, yes, or, or austenite or something else, is by, by doing ATM uh, analysis, and you can actually identify the crystallograph of the phase, because if it's austenite, it's an FCC uh, phase, and if it's martensite, it's BCC. Uh, so, so if we do this, we see this picture here, we see now the, the, the bigger ferrite grains, and then we see these islands here, yes, okay, and then if we do the analysis, these black islands here turn out to be lat martensite. So, and, and what's interesting also is we see that close by these, uh, these martensite islands, we have uh, dislocations more than in the middle, for instance, here. Hmm? So, um, what is the um, uh, trick uh, by which these uh, DP steels work? Well, uh, we have a material and dispersed in there, yes, depending on the strength level you want to have, there is 10 to 20 volume percent of martensite in the microstructure. These are these black uh, particles. And these black particles, um, um, round particles, excuse me, round particles are martensite. And we'll see in a moment uh, how this comes about, but around them there is a region of compression. Yes, the particles themselves are under compression, and around them there is a region where the matrix is under compression, yeah? And in that region, we've got these dislocations. There is a dislocation, yes? Uh, uh, higher dislocation density around these particles, and these dislocations are mobile, yes? They're mobile because their dislocation density is high in comparison to the amount of carbon in solution, right? And you remember, it's the carbon in solution that pins the um, uh, uh, dislocations. Yeah? So uh, first of all, let's go, what are, what are typical um, uh, compositions? Hmm? Well, first of all, like all formable uh, low carbon steels, we like to have a low carbon content, 0.1, less than 0.1. Hmm? And the carbon is, has a number of um, properties. When you add it to, to steel, it, it forms martensite. It helps form martensite. It also hardens the martensite considerably. We know that that's the main element that hardens uh, martensite. It has an impact on the toughness of the martensite. Do we know that if we have very uh, high carbon martensite? We'll see that the carbon of our alloy will determine the amount of uh, martensite we can make in the microstructure. And of course, uh, if we add too much of it, we increase both the content, carbon content of the martensite, and the uh, carbon equivalent value. Hmm? The other elements that are of importance are manganese, which is a uh, gamma stabilizer, it improves the hardenability, i.e. it makes it easier to make uh, uh, martensite, and it reduces the carbon activity uh, 
of uh, carbon, of course, in uh, ferrite, and it's also a, a solid solution strengthening element. Silicon is uh, present in uh, DP steels because it increases the carbon activity in, in the ferrite. It's an alpha stabilizer, so in that sense it's, it does the reverse than um, uh, uh, manganese. It improves the formation of polygonal ferrite in the microstructure. It helps us avoid forming connected martensite particles. When you add the amount of second phase becomes large, yes, uh, the first thing they do, these isolated particles will be connected, yes, and eventually they will form the matrix. But um, it's important for toughness reasons of DP steels that these martensites, uh, islands, remain islands, isolated islands. And uh, silicon also strengthens the ferrite. Uh, phosphorus strengthens the ferrite. And molybdenum and chromium are added to, uh, because they're typical hardening uh, additions. Uh, and we like them because they will, they will help us form martensite by suppressing perlite and bainite formation. Hmm? Okay, and, and these are a number of examples here uh, of, um, of um, industrially used DP steels, yes? In this case, are hot roll DP steels. So important, low carbon, and about, in this case, 0.25 manganese. And then we add the silicon and chromium, yes? And in this case, some titanium was added to have a small grain size, a refined uh, uh, grain size. Yeah? So you usually see uh, silicon and chromium uh, additions to suppress perlite formation. Hmm? Uh, you remember also that silicon is interesting element uh, because it suppresses um, cementite formation, right? So it helps, in that sense, it helps also with uh, the chromium to suppress uh, perlite. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see how we, we make a DP steel, yes, in, um, in a continuous annealing uh, furnace, for instance, okay? So you basically have this um, low, you, you start with a low carbon steel, hmm, which contains about 0.1, let's say 0.1 here, carbon, right? So what do you do to make it, turn it into a DP steel? Well, you heat up, yes, to a temperature of, what temperature? Okay, so that's point number one. The temperature will decide how much martensite you make. The temperature and the original carbon content. Yeah? And uh, just remind you of the fact that when you have a phase diagram, yes, and you are in the two-phase region like this, yes, say in this particular case 0.1% of carbon, yes, the amount, relative amount of ferrite and austenite is defined by the lever rule, okay? So if I call this point A and this point B and this point C, hmm, then the amount of austenite I make, so the phase fraction of austenite is equal to this length divided by this length. So AC divided by uh, BC, okay? okay? So if I want to make the fraction of austenite to be 0.1, so 10% of the volume is austenite, then I have to choose the temperature 
at which this is the case. Yeah? Uh, for a 0.1 uh, carbon content, it's about 750 degrees C. You can see here on, on this phase diagram. Hmm? And, and then two things happen. Yes? The, uh, so so uh, the, some of the um, uh, microstructures become uh, austenite, yes? And there is partitioning. The carbon will partition to the austenite and enrich the austenite in carbon. Hmm? And what will be the amount of carbon I get in the austenite is defined, again, by this temperature. Yeah? So at 750, the carbon content, if I look here, is 0 0.6. 0 0.6. Yeah? So, that's the clever way, the, the, a, a really clever way of doing nothing, yes? Just heating, of course, intercritically, but changing the microstructure partially. And so suddenly you have now parts of the microstructure which contain six times the nominal amount of carbon, yes? Okay, so, so what? Hmm? Well, when you have this microstructure, <coughs> it turns out that when you cool this down, yes, yes, you go, you cool it down fast enough, you go through the MS temperature and the MF temperature. So both the MS and the MF temperature are above room temperature, and you turn this retained austenite fully into martensite at room temperature, a 0.6% of martensite. So it's a pretty high strength martensite that you, that you manage to put in the microstructure. So uh, let me repeat what happened. So the original microstructure, yes, is basically ferrite grains with perlite, right? A little bit of perlite because I, I have point 0.1, that's the microstructure you would have, equilibrium microstructure. You heat this up, this perlite turns into austenite, hmm? and the carbon content in the austenite is now 0.6%. Yes? When I cool this, yeah. This austenite turns into martensite. Okay, now what happens with the uh, during this transformation? Well, you know, austenite is a pretty compact crystalline structure, yes? The, no, the atom density in austenite is much higher than in ferrite, yes? So what happens is you get a volume expansion, yes? So when this, so this would be the original boundary of the austenite, when you transform, it gets larger. Of course, how large is it? Well, if you do the calculation, it's in the book, it's about 4%. Actually, it depends on the carbon content. But at around 0.1 to 0.2% of carbon, that's about the amount of volume difference, right? Uh, so 4%, that's much more than 0.2%, yes? that we know will cause plastic deformation, right? So as a consequence, there are plenty of dislocations are formed here, yes? And of course, you get plastic deformation, and then there is an amount of elastic deformation also, yes, which is still present, 
and which means that there is here around in the ferret surrounding the martensite and the martensite particle are under hydrostatic pressure. There's a hydrostatic pressure. And because we have these, this high dislocation of uh, density, this high density of dislocation around the martensite, um, we never get yield points with DP steels. Never have yield points. Yes. So it's a very nice material because it's got low carbon. It gives me strength. Yes. And it gives me no yield points, even though I have a high carbon content. So it's kind of a nice combination of properties uh, that are essential for press forming, for instance. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, in the uh, the amount of carbon here, you can calculate also almost correctly by noticing that the amount of carbon in the ferrite, the amount of carbon in the ferrite is almost zero. Yes? So, uh, so it means that the total carbon, so tar carbon total, is usually equal to the fraction of ferrite yeah, the fraction of ferrite times the carbon content in the ferrite, yes, plus the fraction of austenite times the carbon content in the austenite, yes. And because this is almost zero, yes, the, uh, the carbon content in the austenite hmm, is about the carbon content in uh, total divided by the fraction of austenite. Hmm? And so that means that if you know if I have only 10% of austenite, I can I can basically increase the carbon content in the martensite tenfold. Yeah? Pretty nice. All right. Now we don't need to make DP steels only in continuous annealing, right? We can make we can make it we can make hot rolled DP steels, right? And we can do this if during hot rolling in the runout table, remember in the runout table, we have step cooling. So this is how it works. So this DP steel, so contains your austenite contains about 0.1 carbon. So you're rolling it as a normal low carbon structural steel, carbon manganese steels. And you, so you finish at 800 to 900 degrees C, and then you keep the temperature constant for a while. Yeah, so you keep it constant. So that, in, so this is a diagram here, um, a, t a TTT diagram, right? So that in the first stage, you form Oh, excuse me, you form ferrite. So you have austenite here. You let the austenite transform to ferrite, yes? And you make about 90% of ferrite, yes? 90% of ferrite. So you, the material comes out of the, the, the hot strip mill. You keep the temperature high, so you... It, it, you go into the transformation, you form ferrite. During the transformation, the austenite will pick up the carbon because we, we're in this place, right? So you, we're at high temperature this time. Yes, the austenite that's formed will pick up the uh, carbon. And then, yes, right before we're cooling, yes, and we have enough, formed enough, ferrite, we cool very quickly to typically 300 degrees C. The austenite that hasn't transformed is there. It contains large amounts of carbon. Yes? And when you cool it, it becomes martensite. So you make a DP steel. 
of course, it's essential to control this pro-eutectoid uh, step. Hmm? So this. So you, you if if, uh, if if we look at it in more detail, you so you uh, you do a, uh, a slow cooling here. That's in more detail what happens here. Slow cooling here. Hmm? So you can uh, you change you form ferrite. This point here is very important because it will determine the amount of martensite you make, the carbon content of the martensite, and then you do a fast cooling in your run, on your run out table to avoid perlite formation, to avoid bainite formation, yes? And in, in the coil, you form martensite. Hmm? So you just need to go below the MS temperature. All right, and, and this is what happens, right? You have two phases. One phase is a soft ferrite phase. The other one is the very hard martensite phase. The dual phase has a composite behavior, yes, where the martensite picks up all the stress and the ferrite gives me the deformation. Yeah? And I can sit anywhere on this line, for instance, if I increase the amount of martensite, yes, my stress strain curve will now be here, yes? So by changing the amount of martensite, I can change the strength level of my DP steel. Okay, and, and here you have some values. Um, uh, the uh, DP steels and uh, typically, um, will have strength levels around 550, that's tensile strength, by the way, or 600, hmm? tensile strength levels, yes. These materials will have in relatively low yield strengths because of the presence of mobile dislocations. So, so the, the mobile dislocations give me are responsible for yield strengths are low and no yield point elongations and no yield points. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so very nice elongations and also very nice strain hardening exponents of um, usually higher than 0.2. And here you have, again, according to uh, standards, the, uh, uh, some typical uh, cold rolled DP grades. Um, so you have strength levels, tensile strength levels, minimum strength levels going from 450 megapascal, 500, 600, 780, 980 uh, strength levels. And of course, as you increase the strength, you have a reduction in the uh, elongation. That's normal. Why is that? Well, you know, to achieve these very high strengths, you, as I just said, you need to increase the amount of martensite. And um, <coughs> yes, martensite is hard, so you will pay some um, um, in terms of elongation. Now, uh, again, these are, um, standards, so the standards tend to be much softer than, than the actual uh, values. Uh, for a 980, uh, you know, the, uh, the elongations are much higher than you easily uh, reach 10 to 15, excuse me, 15 percent of uniform elongation for, for a DP steel. So uh, it's usually in technology you can achieve much larger values. So, uh, DP steel. So, so, but you can see that um, DP steels are very interesting, uh, but um, there is this thing that um, if you want more strength, you need to add more martensite in the, in, the, in the microstructure. That's one thing. Of course, and, uh, a good suggestion would be to reduce the grain size, okay? And people do this, right? Uh, 
uh, but there is something um, that we could do better in this microstructure. Mm -hmm. Certainly if we want to go beyond the strength levels of um, DP steels and if we want to have, if we want to go beyond the formability of DP steels. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why uh, trip steels have um, been developed. Mm -hmm. And so the microstructure at first sight looks a little bit like, um, like uh, a dual phase steel. Uh, so you have uh, larger ferrite grains, yes, and then these uh, very smooth grains uh, can be visible, which again we call the MA, I should have said it earlier, MA constituent, MA being martensite austenite, that means you can't really say from the picture what, they, what it is. Uh, so MA constituent, and another constituent is Bainitic ferrite, yes? And if we look, again, at higher resolution, what do we see? We see this kind of microstructure. So, and in this microstructure, we can, and, and now I'm drawing, I'm being an artist here, I recognize some, what used to be, and we'll see in a moment, intercritical austenite, yes? that has transformed, yes? transformed by a bainitic reaction to uh, this black stuff here, which is basically bainitic ferrite, and this smooth stuff here, this is so-called blocky uh, microstructure, or this elongated constituent here, and it turns out, if you analyze this, again, through, if you analyze this uh, microstructure here, for instance, in a TM, you see these, uh, this lath uh, structure here, you, you find that these white, uh, this white constituent is retained austenite. Hmm? Okay? And that's where the word or the name TRIP comes from. TRIP. Uh, it means transformation induced plasticity. Some people like to say, well, it's not transformation, it's tri, instead of dual phase, uh, tri phase steel, which is also correct. Tri refers to ferrite and uh, bainitic ferrite and retained austenite. Hmm? These are the three constituents. Uh, but the correct word, I think, is, is transformation induced plasticity. True. So, first, before we talk about this effect, let's, uh, 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 before we, we talk about details how we make them, etc., let's look at the mechanism for. Uh, the, uh, the so-called trip effect. In a, in a trip steel, we have uh, small uh, islands of uh, retained austenite. And uh, when this, we strain the material, yes, and let's think we strain the material and we're close to, or locally, a situation arises where you are going to have necking, right? Okay, right. Well, what happens in a trip steel is that when there is a slight reduction of section, right, so the stress is then concentrated in this area, you get transformation. This austenite transforms. And what happens now? So it, tr it transforms not when I'm producing the material, it transforms when I'm making something out of it. So this, aust this austenite transforms to martensite suddenly. Okay. So what happens, the austenite is transformed to a larger, a larger volume, so it ex you have an expansion effect. Yes? That's point number one. And the second point is that I have austenite which transforms to martensite. And martensite is 
much harder place. So I get an expansion plus a strengthening, yes, where this occurs, where this localization is about to occur. So that stops this localization right away, yes? Okay? And so you can deform the material much more, yes, without localization. Yes? So you postpone localization. The strip effect allows you to postpone localization. Yes? And so you get larger uniform elongations. Yes? And also strength, of course, because you uh, because it gives you this local strengthening and, and, and the material in general uh, needs to uh, strain more to, uh, to continue deformation. Hmm? So you suppress uh, necking, you suppress necking, and you increase the uniform elongation. Hmm? Now how would I make something like this? Hmm? Uh, well, it's shown here. Uh, so the thermal cycle is shown here. Let's first think about how it's being done and just look at the uh, uh, the uh, thermal cycle. Okay, well, let's, we start again with the steel that pretty much looks like uh, the DP steel we just discussed. Yeah. It's got... It's basically ferrite and a perlite microstructure. Nothing very complicated. And the carbon levels are slightly higher than the ones of the DP steels, but they're still very low. They're lower than 0.2 or thereabouts. OK, so what do we do with this microstructure? We heat it up, and again, we go intercritical. We go intercritical, and we form austenite and, of course, ferrite, yes. And uh, we'll see in a moment how this is done. The austenite is enriched in carbon. You get, that's according to the phase diagram, the carbon should partition to the austenite. Yeah? And then we cool down. But instead of cooling down to room temperature, as we did for DP steel, we now stop at around 400 degrees C. And we stop at that particular temperature because at that temperature we get the bainite transformation for this steel. So we get a bainite transformation, okay? And so that means that the austenite, this austenite here, transforms to bainitic ferrite and retained austenite, yes? And the retain during this transformation, it's a low temperature transformation. It's a uh, transformation where the substitutional elements don't move. So we have a so-called para-equilibrium situation. The carbon can partition and the other elements don't partition. So we make ferritic bainite and we enrich, gradually in, uh, enrich the um, uh, retained austenite in carbon. And then when we cool down, yes, this retained austenite has so much carbon that it doesn't transform anymore. It's been stabilized at room temperature. Okay, let's have a look at the phase diagram here and try to understand how this works. So we start with a slightly higher carbon content, 0.2%. We go, again, into critical because we want to make a multi-phase steel. Yes. This case, we want to have, make sure we make enough retained austenite. So we have to start with enough intercritical austenite. Yes? It's not like when you make a DP steel, the, um, the amount of austenite you have here will be the amount of martensite you have here. Yeah? In this case, you have, you're going through the bainite transformation, so you have to have a lot more <coughs> uh, ferrite, uh, aust 
intercritical austenite <coughs> than in the case of <coughs> excuse me um, dual phase steel. So about 50 percent. Yeah. So as a consequence, <coughs> we have higher annealing temperatures, about 800 degrees C. Yeah. The carbon content in the intercritical austenite is now 0.4 percent so the enrichment is lower right because in the in for DP steel we were here yes we had increased from 0.1 to 0.6 now we are increases from 0.2 to 0.4 yes but that's not a big problem because we cool down and then we do the isothermal bainitic transformation and the isothermal bainitic transformation will continue till it stops by itself yes hmm? and when does it stop well it stops when the retained austenite carbon content has reached the so-called T0 line yeah? and the T0 line is the point where the carbon content is the, in the in retain is it's so high that it stops the bainite transformation the, the bainite you cannot transform thermodynamically transform the austenite to bainite anymore hmm? at this with the same composition hmm? and that turns out to be at a carbon content which is very high one over one percent yeah? so you have this austenite, which has, um, you know, an MS temperature, which is below room temperature. So the austenite doesn't transform when you cool it. You don't even need to cool it very quickly. Now, there's one key thing in this whole story, yes, that makes it possible, and that is silica. Yes? Because if you know anything about phase transformations or bainitic transformation you'll know that when you form bainite you form bainitic ferrite and then um, carbides yeah so they're normally present there yes so what we form here this this transformation that we get is we make carbide free bainite that's very essential if there if and, and that's why we add silicon. Hmm? You can also add aluminum, or you can also add some phosphorus instead of silicon, because they have about the same effect. But in general, we add silicon. So let's um, do this again. We start with this microstructure. Yes. Let me draw the phase diagram again. Here. Yes. This is the MS temperature. Yes. And here is the T0 line, yes, in our phase diagram. So we heat up, yes, and we go to a temperature where we make 50% alpha and 50% gamma. The gamma content is here, yes. So that means that this, what used to be perlite, is now fully austenite, yes, with about... 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.4% of carbon, yes? Then we cool this down to 400 degrees C, yes? And we just sit there. We let the transformation proceed and the austenite carbon content now increases up to a value that's higher than 1%, yes? Of course, this austenite doesn't remain there, right? It becomes smaller and smaller. And that's why this structure will now consist of, depending on the way the transformation occurs, you will have bainitic ferrite, yes, which has expelled its carbon to the austenite, to the retained austenite, or, so this is like lamellar or film-like austenite, or the austenite can be blocky also, as you've seen in the picture. What is essential here yes, is that this has to be carbide 
free bainite. And, and, and that is only possible if we have silicon in our micro, in our composition. Okay, let's have a look here. Right. What is also important, yes, and um, won't go into detail, is that this, uh, the, the, the structure, to get the, the, the correct rep effect, yes, we must have what is called strain-induced transformation. Hmm? We must have the austenite being formed by plastic deformation. So the austenite needs to plastically deform and then transform to martensite. Yes? So you need strain-assisted transformation. And that happens within a certain temperature range, yes? Which, um, I guess we're a bit, you know, we're reaching the end of the uh, lecture today, so I will I will talk a little bit more about this because you, 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 some of you may be interested in this. So again, uh, important here with with the elements is carbon is slightly higher than for DP steel. We have manganese, gamma stabilizer, and strengthening of ferrite, and then we can have silicon, aluminum, and phosphorus. And they are used to, this is the main reason for their addition. They suppress the uh, carbide formation and make the formation of uh, carbide-free bainite possible. Hmm? And again, some compositions, uh, the, the chrome and moly are added also to, uh, to suppress uh, perlite formation. Sometimes also bainite formation. There are some um, um, people doing this for specific reasons, which we'll discuss uh, next time we meet. Okay, we've arrived uh, to the uh, the end of today's lecture. So thank you very much, and uh, see you on Wednesday. <laughs>